Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I almost forgot my name on my show, Steve. Well, Steve, welcome back to the show. It's your third time on. Is it my third or my fourth, Robbie? Oh, dude. If I'm, it's my fourth. Oh, it's your fourth. All right. I guess you know better than I do. Um, Come on. How I'm, could I forget? Too many episodes. Too many episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Steve, it's a pleasure to have you back. I'm wondering. Now, you took a trip, man. Where'd you go? Man, I work as a uh, when I'm not podcasting. My day job's working in sales, traveling sales. I actually work for a couple of um, American manufacturers of construction machinery. You may know the names John Deere and uh, and oh, hell yeah. yeah! Every every person in America should know what a John Deere. Tra- I saw a guy in a giant pickup truck, and I guess it's the classic redneck where you have to have these essential things like Oakley sunglasses if you're a fisherman or a redneck, and then you have a John Deere sticker on the back of your truck. I'm like, it's a it's for mowing your lawn. What are you trying to show people that you're a hard worker? <laughs> basically yeah yeah look you get some of those guys here and to describe where i went look you know australia is a massive place like america um but i think you guys would probably relate to i went out back you know um into the country towns the, the harvest season's on so out there selling yeah cotton harvesters tractors um different sorts of yeah farm equipment and that sort of stuff so it was a big road trip yeah five days um drove six hours back tonight got home changed gave my little boy a kiss leonidas and um, went and played some volleyball came back home and started drinking and you told me let's do a podcast so here i am i think it's great to take those days off where you don't really worry about the podcast a whole lot usually i have like 10 or 15 episodes in the tank but i mean i got one that's it because i just the past week or so i've just been taking days off man i've been trying to relax and get a little bit more in tune with not me as a person but just nature in general like there's some primal stuff about it that you can truly forget and i think that's what a lot of people need is to take that step back from the cell phone because this isn't something that um i was talking to a a radio astronomer and he was talking about that we are class one civilization and i was like well what's the basis of classes he goes well class two is when you discover you're in space and you're colonizing on a whole nother planet and you're learning new ways to adapt and survive and i was like yeah we look at all the generational periods all leading up into where we're at right now we've never gotten out of civilization two but especially with you studying spartan history for instance there's a massive leap in the amount of time from then to now in just innovation but if you look at the grand scale of the timeline of the age it's not a huge thing compared to our technological innovations that we've created the cell phone 20 years ago is unthinkable but now it's so normal to us and that was just in a 20-year time period america a couple hundred years old doesn't seem like it It seems like it had a little bit more time on its hands but it actually had less than we think we do so i look at it like there's primal stuff out in the world and i think when you truly advance or we're advancing at the rate that we're advancing in we're forgetting the essential basics of just the primal things about our characteristics like a lot of people don't know like why do people get a dad bod when they have a kid well your body starts to store more fat because it understands that you're about to go through long periods of time when your kid's a baby of not being able to get sleep so it's trying to store energy for those essential minutes that you're going to be losing because now you have a newborn to take care of so it's like our I don't know is there's there's a lot of stuff where it's like man there's got there's a basic template to our bodies and how we all function every single person no matter your gender or no matter your ethnicity and it's very very interesting to me to see how those things tick because I believe they also correlate to the world that's around us you know going out into nature when that sun hits your skin it's not just vitamin d you're absorbing something a little bit more pure and more primal than that yeah, you're right. How, how wide is the lens of this camera? How did you know that I had the dad bod going on there? I, uh, <laughs> I, res- I resemble that remark, but no, look, you're 100% right. And I think, um, you know, to go back to Sparta, you know, it, it can seem like a long time from then. And in fact, I think we're either on or just passing the 2501st anniversary of the Battle of Thermopylae, which was um, you know, pretty famous for the Spartans there. And I think if you look over time there, there wasn't a great deal of change in civilization until we hit sort of the, the Renaissance and the Reformation and then the enlightenment era through there and obviously with the industrial revolution things started to pick up but you can definitely see that you know the last 20 or 30 years in regards to technology and and medicine advancements and things like that that you know this it seems to be speeding up you know the process is getting smaller and smaller getting more powerful everything's getting a lot more advanced and you can see that comes a time where where you know we may need to leave this earth um behind and i wonder what happens to us as a species when we when we do that because like you you were just saying that 
so much of, of our interactions and the way that we behave are uh, intrinsic to the human species, you know, and has been since what, 200,000 years when we, we first sort of separated from the primates, like where, where do we go after we leave this world? Like, you know, how do we, how do we define ourselves? And these are big questions for the, for the future and future generations, but yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to consider for sure. It's kind of like the younger Dryas theory, which is that there's been – we're not the first mm. civilization. It's just constantly a reset. The world keeps resetting. The world's going to be around here longer than we will. But I yeah. wonder if we eventually hit that civilization too, we're able to colonize on a planet. It's going to be interesting because it's a whole new future that we're not going to be able to predict. Now, you can always predict events based on past events that have happened. A lot of it kind of correlates the same. But yeah. if you already have the knowledge that we have now and now we discover living on a whole other planet, there's not going to be a Spartan age. There's not going to be all these innovations that happens. That means every history that happens after that, how many times are we going to reset on civilization two where the moon just keeps resetting that moon planet or whatever one we discover next and we start living on? How many times is that going? reset until we get it right and then we go to civilization three like there's not going to be a reset like if the world reset right now and we all were dead and then we all had to restart back up again it would probably start off the same with trying to find maybe alternative ways to survive again instead of using electricity we probably use steam or maybe there might be other methods that would happen but if we're on another planet and it resets then we still have the knowledge of all those things that we have done in the past and it doesn't reset that it's like if i was able to reincarnate you and into another younger body or something, but I gave you all the knowledge you have now, all the experience and wisdom that you've gained over the years and been able to put it into a younger form, let's at, at a 10 year old's body, but then reincarnation of just being 10 and not remembering your past lives. Maybe that's why people are so obsessed with trying to find reincarnation so they can discover like a 90 year old version of themselves and be able to figure it out and put it into their younger form. Absolutely. Oh, that's a, I guess as the, uh, not that I'm that old, but as the years do progress, you know, you often fantasize a little bit about, oh, wow, if I could be 20 years younger again, but you, I wouldn't trade the last 20 years of experience just to go back to 20 years. I mean, it'd be an absolutely redundant exercise, you know, not having been able to acquire or promote and use on, on my younger self, the experience that I have now. So, you know, I think without that, without that knowledge, without that experience, and without that tenure of, of living, it'd be almost pointless to go to go back. So, I mean, that's the that's the ultimate, isn't it? A twenty year old me with what I know now, well, that'd be a that'd be a dangerous perspective. I can tell you right now. I don't think I mean, I mean it's probably more dangerous to the people around you because you'd be like walking around <laughs> like a god. Like I'm so I'm so advanced compared to most 20 year olds. But then you look at the factor of like I think when you're exposed to if you put your 90 year old self into a younger version, then you're also aging. You're missing the moments that you're supposed to be ex experiencing when you're at that age. Like for me, I'm 23. Most kids mm. my age are out drinking or partying or staying up really late at night and then going into work late or hating their life or becoming alcoholics. I'm not that way. I mean, yeah, I do like the occasional drink. A whiskey slushy is amazing. But I'm also thinking on a level where I talk to most 20-year-olds and it seems like I'm talking – I should be talking to someone that's maybe older than that just because of how I've kind of aged myself through different experiences and different perspectives from the show. I mm. Someone said it best to me. They go, you're supposed to let all this stuff weigh you down throughout your life, but I've consumed it all in like a short amount of time. You literally get to see – see me break in a way and it's true because i think when when i see people freak out when i see people have these giant lash outs on social media or they go oh screw this political stuff or this giant thing that's happening it's insane and they start screaming like you see a video of a person screaming about a mask inside of a store or something like that <laughs> this person has just experienced too much in a short amount of time where they're trying their best to act out. And I think this is when people give crap to the millennials or the Gen Z's. I'm like, because their social capacity, they're mentally aging themselves by 20, 30 years with the amount of exposure that social media has. You know, kids back in old, way back in the day, used to hunt or learn how to hunt with a family member or experience what it's like to try and survive. That was the biggest threat. Now you have threats that are overseas that you can't control. Now you have threats in other news articles. You're trying to find out what information is real. You're trying to be able to be successful in a world where there's constantly content being created every single minute. And it, I'm scared for it because I wonder, would a civilization reset be so bad? 
It mm. would suck that everybody dies, but then if it restarts again, maybe there's another method or another loop or another pathway we can be able to do. But we were so far as we can tell, we were the, probably the farthest that we've ever been in any civilization impact if you're basing it off of the younger driest theory. But who's to say that this is the one that succeeds into the next civilization? Because there's a lot of stuff where we're basically already at the point of breaking and tearing each other down, much like, you know, with the Spartans, the last ideology that got boiled down to was gender. And then we're at that and we're going past that. So I'm wondering if this is going to be another reset where we're just on another loop and this isn't the right time, or is it, do you think there could be another reset? I mean, it's an interesting thought. I know I don't mean to throw a whole bunch on you, but it's making me think now that we're talking about it. <laughs> you throw a whole bunch on me. That would be completely out of character. You're, <laughs> you're in a very unique position, Robbie. You know, you're you're a young guy with that that youthful exuberance, but you've spoken to a vast array of people, and you've you've I guess joined in their experiences. You know, and you're you're a great conversationalist. So you can tell when you're talking to you. You know, you're you're engaged in in the, in the process of a conversation. So you know, you've got the benefit of I guess of of other people's perspectives you know and you've also got that very carefree attitude yourself so it hasn't broken you it hasn't weighed you down but it's definitely enhanced your your outlook and i guess in answer to your question um as a as a amateur historian uh you know i can tell you that that history is is doomed to repeat itself if you want to know what's going to happen in the future you need to just find a set of correlations in the past and you can basically guarantee it so if there was going to be a reset and it was still going to be human beings um as in our species homo sapiens um populating the earth I could guarantee you that things would probably turn out exactly the same as they turned out now, because we would be doomed to to keep on repeating things. And you hope that, you know, things could get it incrementally a little bit better. But, you know, as you described, you know, it takes, you know, one or two little things to get triggered on social media. And before you know it, people are, are saying things that they they certainly wouldn't say to people's faces, but they just feel uninhibited and, and the rage, it's palpable um, with the polarisation in, in views on politics, uh, you know, on COVID, uh, religion gender um obviously you know the oppressor oppressed narrative like it's just crazy at the moment like you know and you know you know you're you're, you're a clever guy you, you see what's going on in the world you talk to a lot of people like it's all really inconsequential when you think about the the really important stuff that's happening on the world and things that we should unite on and fight um as a as a i guess as a culture as a, as a western civilization to stand up for the for the people that don't have it as good as us but I think it's just too hard, mate. I think it's just too difficult. So we just end up bickering about things and you know worrying about getting the pronouns correct and things like that when it, it's not essential, really, is it? It's just I think it's the processing of our information, for instance, where everyone's the hero of their own story, but everyone's also the biggest enemy in their own story as well, too. And whatever information that you choose to sort out with now, there's so much out there that now to make it easier, easier with you know emphasis on easier, um, it was to limit it and put it into a group to find your class, to find your group of people to help connect with, to help that agree with you, that help kind of support your ideas and help you grow even farther. But now it's gotten into a part where you're in such a niche group that everything you've ever seen is that information. You've never seen the opposite opposing view. You've never seen anything that contradicts that. You've never seen anything that might have a different perspective into that. And now that's where the fighting starts to begin. You're tearing other people apart because they necessarily don't agree with the things that you agree with. And then you realize, oh, wait, everybody doesn't think that – like, for instance – um. I was talking to a sleep scientist and I was like, yeah, sleep's not. So, yeah, that's good. Everybody loves sleep and everyone likes that idea, but we never want to die, but we always want sleep. But then I look at the concept of like, yeah, sleep is like uh, everyone likes it, but there's not a whole lot of talking about it. And they're like, well, I don't know where you're at, but there's a lot of people that talk about it. I go, because you're in that group. You're in yeah. that variety of people that only talk about sleep. You're a sleep scientist. You connect with other sleep scientists. It makes you think like, well, sleep, everyone knows about sleep. It's like, no, not everybody does know about it. There's people that play modern warfare all day, and all they do is play Call of Duty and video games and Xbox. They – they're surrounded by people that play nothing but Xbox. They don't know what PlayStation is. They don't know what the PC is. They might have heard of it, but they don't know the whole entire community groups that get surrounded with that. And when you start to limit yourself in that way, even though it's 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 disguised as succeeding or a beneficial to your growth or creating a community aspect, it's not a real community though. It's it's only yes men. 
It's mm-hmm. only people that agree with you, and it's not letting outside sources in. But that's the whole point of trading back in the day. Trading with other people, going to markets, going to all these things. You like your town. You like your little group. You like your little community that you have. But when you go to another village and you trade with them and have different resources, you start to realize why like silk was being brought over here. All these different things that were like – this is even around in the area. Yes, because they were trading and they were coming in contact with people that weren't in this area and they were helped discovering new sources. That's why we were able to find gold in places there wasn't any gold. And you know what I mean? It's interesting to look at that and see how we're doing the same thing today, but in the opposite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. That, um, that the desire to be in an echo chamber and surrounded by nothing but confirmation bias, you know, it's, um, I'm a God. (laughs) Oh, you know, like it's just, it does my head in, you know, because I mean, I've got some of my best friends. We don't see eye to eye on a lot of topics, you know, but we can have discussions about things. You know, we can sit down and and talk about things. We may not come to a consensus, but it's not important because just surrounding yourself with with pointless yes men, as you say, that's a, that's a really boring existence. You know, like you need to be challenged, you know, as, as humans, the, 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 the true meaning in life is, is is responsibility and it's challenge and it's struggle you know when it's when it's just too easy everything's hard you know like you, you've got to have that struggle and I, and I didn't really realize that till I guess till I became a father that was what really sorted it out for me after that I realized that I was just floating around doing whatever I want I was having an absolute blast but now that I've got this this responsibility this overarching concern that you know I have to be obligated to that 110% all the time. And look, I've still got free time in and around it. We can have a chat every so often on here. I can do my podcast. I can play some computer games, have a drink here and there. But it's the responsibility. It's that challenge. It's that struggle that gives my the rest of my life the meaning, you know. And, and that's the same as anything. Whether you're in a conversation with people, you know, whether you're um, out in the world, you know, making friends, meeting people, like you, you need challenge. Without challenge, we stagnate. And when you stagnate, you rot. And that's what's happening, I guess, to the core of humanity at the moment. It's getting very, very rotten, you know, like it needs an injection of, of responsibility and personal attainment. But it just seems like everybody's leaning into, um, what's the term, like to victimhood, you know, like it's how, how I can be a victim, how I can, you know, a poor me, woe is me, like where's the, where's the support for this, where's the support for that? But, you know, at the time of day, especially when I was younger, like the, the story always was, you know, you need to lift yourself up by the by the bootstrap. You know, you need to drag yourself out of the gutter and, you know, nobody's going to give it to you on a silver platter. And when you see that in history in particular, like you see um, societies and cultures given uh, given things, given goods, given gifts, given given a free ride, and, and it has happened often in history, that the culture that, that receives that never respects it. You know, you only ever respect what you earn and what you fight for. And I think that's what we're really missing. We're looking for something and we just don't know what it is. And I think it's responsibility. There's a, this is probably going to be a bad example. It's going to piss off a lot of people, but there's a thing where when you would call out of work because you're sick or you would call out of work and you would say, oh, I had a family member pass away. Did you have a family member pass away? Maybe you didn't, but it got you off work, right? Then eventually you start using that excuse every single time. And next thing you know, you start to realize that you become comfortable with using excuses to get away with things. A lot of people now, like when we walk around the world, I feel like a lot of it's just hollow. A lot of everything now is just doesn't have anything inside of it, doesn't have it because we all have our minds. And when I when I mean our minds, I mean we're in our minds way too much. We're in our heads way too much. It was cool to be in the clouds at times and have dreams, but at the same time, you were also based in reality in some aspects when it comes to just making sure you're able to function, you're able to eat, you're able to stay healthy, you're able to do the things that you need to do to survive. We're not really doing that anymore. A lot of people are neglecting basic body functions because they're scared or because of the fact they love social media or because of the fact that they rather fight with someone online and choose. I used to play video games all the time. I would go 14 hours and the next thing I'd be like, what the hell? It's dark out already? You've been eat- <laughs> My dad would drop a plate of PB&J, like peanut butter sandwiches, in front of me. And be like, you need to eat, man. It's been 14 hours. I'm not even hungry. I didn't realize time flew by that fast because you're so focused into one thing. We've all kind of, instead of opening up to different pathways, had a one track mind where now we're not focused on back in the day was surviving. Now we're focused on what did this post, what's going to make me success, what's going to get me successful. And I think with having one of my videos taken down off YouTube for a brief amount of time, and then finally realized that it wasn't against community guidelines, it got reposted all that progress that was just gone like that. You start to realize the amount of effort that you're putting into something. I look back, like my podcast is three is going to be three years old. I go, well, it almost is three years old. I go now imagine if I just 
did something else and I didn't do the podcast, I wouldn't have the thoughts that I have now. Maybe I would have a relationship. Maybe I would have some type, maybe I could even be a dad. I don't know if it works that quick, but it, Hey, it only takes nine <laughs> months. Right. Um, that's from the, that's if they're a major slut too, I'm talking about like, you'd have to meet them. And then nine months later, but I look at it like, would I want to give that time back up or would I want to like to see another dimension where there's an alternate timeline where I never did the podcast and I just lived my life and maybe I got a business opportunity or maybe I stayed, went back to school or did something. I go, I don't know, because what are we basing success off of? Is success just being able to think properly? I consider the most probably beneficial skill is just trying to be a critical thinker. You know, mm. we see a headline and we run off with it, but do we ever look into it? Do we ever research what that is? Do we ever see something and really try and we examine it for face value? But do we ever see the hidden intent or what might be in there? And there's a difference between critical thinking and schizophrenia. When you start thinking people are <laughs> microchipping you, you might be schizophrenic. But if you look at it like, is, are there actual health negative side effects of something? Or are you looking into something and saying, well, this might be a bill that's being passed and it says for roadways. So they're going to use it for roadways. When have they ever said that they were going to do the thing that they said they were going to do? Look into that a little bit deeper. Oh, less than 4% of an infrastructure bill is being used to roadways. It's just critical thinking, but they go, no, that's a conspiracy. I get it. The word sounds similar. Conspiracy, critical thinking. They both start with the letter C. I get it. <laughs> but it's about just understanding and expecting when you really look at how many times do people reach out to you? when they only want something how many times do people actually care about you know when someone sends you or calls you and you see that number ring up and you go what do they want from me now that's all the world is now i mean i'm probably at fault doing the same thing i reached out to you about doing a podcast episode but i also want to talk to you as well too but how many people see something when they i get messages all the time from guests that were on, on episode 100 saying Hey man, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. You want to do another podcast episode? I'm like, when you've never liked the post of mine, you've never done anything ever since your episode was published. So I'm wondering why you just reach out now. And I think it's because they see that, oh, maybe I can get something from this person. Mm -hmm. And then I was ended up like maybe down the road, they ended up blocking me. And I was like, I'm fine with that because all you're doing is using someone to be able to get to a pathway to where you want to go. And I'm like, I honestly, I, there's nothing I need from you, Steve. I just want your conversation. I appreciate who you are as a person. You know, that's a very hard thing to ask or expect people to want out of somebody. It's just them as a person. They look at it. What's the next platform that's going to get me somewhere further? People say, I want to get famous people on my show. I don't. I don't at all. They're harder to deal with. They're harder to narrow down. They only are, they're like an avocado. They're only good one hour of the day that you use them. <laughs> And I'm like, there's no other point. I'm like, I'd rather have a better conversation with someone who might not have a, a comedy special or something because it's going to engage in a better content created episode. And I'm going to learn something more from that and examine value as a person. But we don't see that in everyday life now. We look at it like, well, what's the point of me helping you move? Well, you're a friend, right? I uh, recently... um went to my buddy's house and we had to do this whole event of getting his mom's boyfriend a grill for his birthday. And it was just epic shit show truck broke down. I was hammered already. It was eight o'clock in the morning. Don't judge me. It was my day off and I work 1am. So that's a, that's a midday for me. So I was like, all right, I'm going to drink, had a little bit of whiskey, went to go get this grill grill was like needed 10 people to carry it. It's a huge, like giant rotisserie barbecue grill, the size of like six Hercules. And <laughs> We put it on a boat thing, uh, we like a thing that hauls a boat, a boat, a boat trailer. So there was holes in it. So I, he was like, just sit on the back and hold it while I drive. I'm like, that sounds smart. That sounds smart as shit. No, it's not. Truck broke down in the middle of the street. But this whole event, I end up, we end up getting home. I think like three hours later, I'm covered in sweat. I'm sitting on his chair. I'm like, ah, oh, that was a terrible time. And he just goes here, man, goes to hand me 20 bucks. I'm like, what's this for? He's like, for helping me out. I was like, we're friends. I didn't even expect that to even be offered out to me. I'm not taking it. I, we do this cause we're friends. Oh yeah, we are friends. Yes. Yes. You don't always need something out of somebody to help them out with something. If everyone lived by that standard, we might have a better world. I'm just saying, maybe I'm crazy. Yeah. No, not at all. And I, I'd never judge anybody for getting hammered at eight o'clock, but I, I will judge you for eating uh, peanut butter and, and jelly sandwiches. I can tell you like, that's nothing more disgusting what? in my life. Oh, that's peanut butter and jelly. Oh, it's revolting. I had a Canadian uh, 
exchange teacher when I was very, very young. And she was lauding peanut butter and jelly to me um, when she was over here. And she promised when she went back to Canada, she'd send me some peanut butter and jelly. And I would have been, Christ, like eight or nine years old. And I was waiting for this package and the peanut butter and jelly comes in the mail. I don't know how it came from Canada in the mail, but that's how it came. And I put some on the bread and I ate it and I almost vomited. I was like, that's the most revolting thing I've ever had in my life. Like, we don't have peanut butter and jelly in Australia. We've got peanut butter. We've got jelly, but I think it's jam. That's what we call it over here. Mm. But we don't put them together on the same sandwich. That's rough. But look, yeah, you look 100% right. Um, yeah, people can be incredibly vacuous. Um, and you get better, I guess, at, at, at sorting out the chaff. The wheat from the chaff as you get a little bit older. And you know, you've got the benefit of, of so much conversational experience that you, know, you could probably see a sycophant coming from a mile away, you know, like, like you said, you know, this guy hadn't been in contact with you for 800 episodes, you know, never engages with you on any other platform whatsoever and was probably just looking to promote something he had going on there. And, you know, th those sorts of people, you know, you're, you're best off just letting them go by the wayside. But I guess, you know, like your buddy who you help move, you know, if you've got a friend who, um, who helps you move, I think moving is probably one of the, the most arduous and laborious tasks around, you know, you get a guy to, to help you do that. That's a, that's a good friend. You know, you do that for somebody, that you care about and these are the things that that mean a lot in friendship but yeah you're right a lot of people these days they just you know it's it's a very reflective world you know you're you're, you're continuously thinking about yourself you know and, and i think social media has played into that you know you, you put a post out there you're constantly looking for how many love hearts are popping up on twitter or how many likes you're getting how many shares you're getting you know like the the the, the culture is such that you know we're almost conditioned to to think about ourselves you know like on all the talk shows it's like you know, you are a special person, you know, you deserve to be top of the chain, you know, and I think we're, we're, we're fed on the, on, on the tit of, of success as we're, as we're growing up. And I think as people get into their twenties and their thirties and they realize that that dream is just ephemeral, you know, it just goes up in smoke. And I think that's where a lot of the rage comes from, you know, that they're, that they're disappointed, you know, they thought their lives were just going to work out for themselves, but they didn't invest in character building. They didn't invest in strong, solid relationships and they're left really hollow. I mean, back when you used to complete maybe a task or used to have a mission back in the day and say the Spartan era, I'm always going to relate it back to Sparta, but please do, please. <laughs> but when um, you complete a task, you got a praise, you got honor, you got valor from that. Now, when you put up a post, you get a like, you get a love, you get a comment, you might get a share. It's the same thing, but I'm wondering when that, uh, obviously the, the routine or the amount of time that gets put into the task is different. Anybody can type up, I'm sad, and then they get a like or something. Back in the day, you used to have to kill a bear to be able to get like a trophy or something like that. But when we look at the technology that's advancing so much, when is that shift? There's going to be an inevitable cliff jump where we can't. We're, we won't be working off that template anymore. We're not going to be working off of getting a, a achievement or something off of a task that we complete. You know, when you move on to the next civilization, society two or civilization two, you're going to drop off a lot of things from civilization one. And I'm wondering if they were necessarily things that needed to be dropped off or they were going to be something that's going to hurt our whole entire species and lead us to inevitable downfall. The community aspect in the world that has now been hollowed out and now it seems more of hatred than anything. Mm -hmm. People say, well, people have always been fighting for generations upon generations. Yeah, but never this easy. It was never this easy to be able to send a message to someone across seas and be able to spark up animosity saying one person's country is worse than another person's country. It was never this easy. It was never this easy to say that you're taking someone's mom to town that night, even though they live right down the street from you and you're 10 years old saying that. Like you start looking at the basic things where it's like fighting has been easier and it's not wrong. It's just because we're all the heroes in our own story and we're all the enemies in it as well, too. But then when everybody looks like a nail and you're a hammer, that's the issue is that now we've there's so much information out there and it's not information that we need. Um, I wanted to bring this up to you because now they're suspecting that the Great Fire of Alexandria, a lot of the books actually are now sitting in the Vatican archives. Uh, that was, <laughs> so that was a conspiracy for a while is the Vatican's probably holding a lot of secret information. Well, one person took a tour of the Vatican and actually got a bunch of recommendations to be able to check through their library. And he's noticing a lot of things that were allegedly burned in the great fire of Alexandria. So they're starting mm -hmm. to look through, maybe we should get in here and see what information they're willing, but they're not going to open up any of that information for the public. That's just private stuff. So 
I, hopefully maybe one day we'll be able to get like a central freedom of information act or something can get that all out there. <laughs> but I, I'm looking at it like the flow of information is restricted by censorship, but the censorship was intended to be good. But how do they decipher what's good when they can just ban anything? My video got flagged for medical disinformation when it was everything that I've heard on in actual articles that the CDC has already posted about. I sent them that. They re-uploaded it saying, you're correct. We're sorry. We didn't. It, it doesn't violate our thing. I was like, I know it doesn't. But when you do that to someone, Facebook is banning millions of fake profiles and bots accounts every single day. But I'm still seeing why the hell is Catfish? Why is that still a TV show? That's real horrible shit where, where you're watching the show. I'm watching and I'm like, I hope they find this motherfucker and I hope they beat the shit out of him for making him spend all this money to be able to do so. Then you see the guy and you're like, oh, I just feel sad. Like the one dude on there was like, I'm going to beat this guy's ass. I can't believe he's been lying to me and faking. And it's this dude. He sees him. And he goes, bro, can you just pray with me? And I'm like, that's a human being. You lose all that anger when you see it's just a person who's not happy in their life. And that's everyone online. Most of the time when they're striking out animosity, it's like someone hurts you. They're going through something. It's very easy to get their aggression out towards someone else. There's so many times I see somebody post or retweet something and I just want to fucking light them up with a comment. But I go, what's the point of this? They probably have a bunch of information in their head or things that they've seen where they're in belief of that. And I'm not going to tear them down from that. I'm going to talk to them and understand how they think so I can help them understand how I think. And maybe we can get some conversation going. But then you realize, oh, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Oh, that's not good. That's not right. You should always listen to what someone says, whether they say the earth is flat or the sun doesn't exist or we're in a simulation or birds aren't real. You have to listen to what they say because then you get to a better grasp of who they are as a person. In a, two minutes of a conversation, you should be able to sense out if a person is good or if a person's mentally unwell or if a person's crazy. I see all these videos. Um, there's a woman freaking out in the score like, you're not wearing your mask. You're getting me sick. And she's like seizuring on the ground, like just having a freak out and crying and screaming. And everyone's like this crazy bitch. And I was like, I look at that and I'm just like, that's a person that's going through a lot. Like it's going is it has literally just mentally not well and just needs someone to probably talk to them. There's a guy who jumped off the golden gate bridge and I read his documentary. It was a thing I had to do in my psychology class in college and it was a community college. So careful there, Steve. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> when he was talking about, he goes, I was on this bus and I started crying and he goes, nobody even asked me how I was doing. Nobody asked me if I was okay. And I walked off that bus and I jumped off the bridge and he survived. But if somebody would have just said one word to him, he would have not jumped. Somebody would have just reached out to him. How many times do we see a crazy person on a bus and we don't reach out to them? Somebody's crying or someone's screaming or someone's yelling on the phone and we just ignore, keep our heads down, look forward. That community yeah, aspect yeah. is gone. You used to know in your village, somebody was suffering in your village. Now we don't even know who's suffering in our house. Yeah. Yeah. It's a question of, um, I guess of stakes, isn't it? Like, you know, of, of what's on the line, you know, like you are interacting with somebody on Twitter or Facebook, they're just a, a faceless entity, you know, you can choose to engage with them or not, but at the end of the day, they're, they're very dehumanized by the fact that they're just a, an emoticon and some white characters on there. And I think if you take it back to ancient times, the, the stakes could never have been higher back in those days. And for, for the Spartans in particular, they, you know, they, they've obviously got a, a strong reputation of as, as warriors and as a warrior society and, and they were a warrior society but they were very discerning with the way that they chose their battles you know like they had they were surrounded by enemies they were you know universally hated at different times by the various other greek city states but they weren't out there fighting every single day of the week they had concerns at home they had families to raise they had land to to look after well they had they had slaves to do that but there was another concern that they, they couldn't leave sparta because they had to keep the helots enslaved and keep them under oppression there but you know, in ancient times, it was a it was a hell of a thing to to lock shields with somebody and go face to face. You know, the the stakes could never have been higher. You know, your life was on the line. These days, you can say whatever you want. You know, and there's very little repercussion. You know, and, and some of the vitriol and hatred that comes out. It, I mean, the moderators on on Twitter and, and Facebook are great at shutting people down when they say something that isn't part of the popular narrative, but. As far as the venom and the and the hate that gets slung around there, like nobody's really there to police that. I, I have to ask you quickly, what what did you um what did your episode get taken down to? Or you you weren't talking about ivermectin by any chance, were you? Well, 
if that doesn't get me taken down off YouTube for this episode, then <laughs> I, I, I we're not I, endorsing ivermectin, Robbie. We're I, not endorsing it. I think <laughs> I might have ta- mentioned that word, and I also think I mentioned that you spread it the same. And I think that's uh, been commonly known that you do spread it the same. You, you just lessens your symptoms. And I guess YouTube yeah. is like medical misinformation. And I was like, I don't think yeah. so. And they're like, oh, wait, no, it doesn't. But I also talked about Disney controlling the world, too. But, I mean, it's episode uh, 885, so people can just look that way. I'll have to go and check. i have to go and check it out. See, look, I mean, you know, there's conspiracy theories. I hate that term, um, you know, because there are conspiracies. You know, like, you know, we've got ASIO over here. You've got the FBI and the CIA, CIA over there. You've got the KGB. Um, you know, those people are actively conspiring against other people. So, you know, conspiracies are real. And, you know, it's crazy that 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 YouTube would would pull down your podcast where you're just, dude, having conversations with people, you know, like, <laughs> like it's like anybody listening to anything. If you're taking your, you know, if you're not using your critical thinking with what you're hearing then and you make mistakes based off that, well, that's, that's your bad fault. It's not up to Facebook or, or YouTube or Twitter to censor anything like censorship is never a good thing like it's you know if you go back to to world war ii um you know like hitler began to censor the media mm-hmm. you know he had he controlled all the information that was coming out you know especially around the jews you know talking about them being parasites and, and filth and scum that they needed to be cleansed and things like that and, and really whipped up a fury and a fear within the people and you see that same fear today with with covid like people have this natural aversion uh to to parasites and diseases and um it was always the risk when two cultures met as you just described earlier on with trade um yes of course you know they had they had gold and you had ivory and you want to trade for that but there was always the risk of you know getting the black death or getting typhoid or, or syphilis or some some other you know bacterial infection to come in so you know, th- these things are very, very hard to contain and you can't contain them by using censorship. You know, that just makes people more conspiratorial by nature. You know, like everybody, all information needs to be out there. And, you know, th- there's that common one that gets told all the time. You know, you can't, you don't have the freedom to say fire in a, in a crowded room or, or something like that, you know, which is just, it's just ridiculous. Nobody's doing that anyway, but you should be able to have free discussions uh, about whatever. Look, if it's, if it's COVID, um, look, if it's gender, if it's if it's race, like you should be able to talk critically about these things. And if people are censoring, that's just to me that that makes me very suspicious when that happens. So if you're getting if you're getting one of your episodes pulled down, that makes me very very suspicious. So I'm going to go back and have to have a listen to eight eight five. The main thing is is that when I have a person who believes in a lot of the conspiracy stuff, and I'm not my show is never about telling someone that they're wrong. It's just about understanding their perspective, yeah. and we I, I'll agree with it most of the time. Um, just to, un, you know, to understand their side and speak it with them. And then you get a better elevation. They unlock and get comfortable and then you can get this whole conversation flow going. But it's like comedy when they say you used to cancel comedians and all this stuff. Bill Burr mm-hmm. said it best. He goes, when you cancel a comic because something they say offended you, all you're doing is you're taking away their livelihood or their job where they go home and now they can't feed their family and they breed their kids to hate that certain thing that they got canceled for. Instead, if they say a joke and nobody laughs and their comedy has to evolve, we don't think like we did back in the day when a lot of ethnicities and genders didn't have rights. We don't think like that at all. That's because we focused in and that stuff is still in history to be able to look up and see the horrors of it. And now we don't think like that anymore. When you ban information, when you block information because it's harmful, you're not letting people evolve their thought. You're thinking that people are going to be dumb idiots and accept that the earth is flat. And I'm not saying the flat earthers are idiots. I'm just saying something as ridiculous as a lot uh, goes against basic normal thinking when it comes to that we know the earth isn't flat something like i could say that steve you're a god and in some aspects some person out there's like steve is a god i praise to him every single day and they start praying to you but is that true as far as i could tell you're not a god you're an amazing person but you don't have any mystical powers unless you want to grant me some wishes but (laughs) that that idea is like if you ban that because that's being said, then there's no evolution of thought, and now you're leaving room open for these conspiracy things. A recent article was trending because this is going to be the 20th anniversary for 9-11. All the families are saying it's been 20 years. Can we get those documents that you withheld from the public? And I'm like, they withheld documents? I read a 584 fucking commission report about the 9-11 thing. You're telling me there's more that they didn't include in there? Yeah, they're still keeping docu- document secret. What are you keeping secret still after a national tragedy? This is why we still have conspiracy theories. This is why I tell people, keep 
the, the lab thing. He had 90 days to release the lab thing. He never talked about it still. Now it's saying it's we might never know. I'm like, then that's where conspiracies come in because you're not giving everybody the 100% truth. Let them decipher it for themselves. If aliens are real, fucking tell people aliens are real. Well, we don't know if the public can handle that. You're, you're, dis, you're censoring some weird shit. You're really like you're picking and choosing, and it's the weirdest way of how you decipher what you pick and choose to what goes out there. If somebody you shouldn't, I agree with you that censorship is never a good idea. I believe it has good intent with never making sure that some person hurts themselves because of somebody saying something to them online. But when does the line get drawn? Does that mean if you're a doctor suggesting health concerns, which this is a, a, a real example, suggesting that you might need to lose weight because you're at risk for comorbidities, you get banned because now you're fat shaming? What the fuck <laughs> is that shit? That's real stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's madness. That is absolute effing madness. You know, like the the whole the whole narrative around that there's there's no solution but a but a vaccine for 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 COVID when you know. The, the numbers are clear. The data is out there. Like, you know, if you take care of yourself, if you're healthy, you don't have comorbidities and things like that. And that's just a simple fact. It's not you being an ableist or, or fat shaming or anything. And, and we shouldn't live in a society where, where that's a problem. Has it been 20 years since, since 9-11? You know that my birthday is actually on the, on the 12th or the 9th. So um, obviously we're a, a day ahead of you guys. And I remember that day very distinctly. I was up having a massive party with some friends and we were, the TV was on when it came. Uh, on TV, and we were just we were gobsmacked. We were absolutely gobsmacked by what was happening. It, it, I thought this is some sort of movie. This is some sort of prank. This is some sort of joke. And physically watched it about 1:45 a.m. Uh, local time. The second plane uh, hit the other tower, and the world changed in that moment. And I think that perhaps that moment for the Western world, for our world, because definitely it, it, it affected. I mean, obviously it affected America a lot more than over here. But we take our lead from America and Australia, and it was a. Uh, I think that planted a little bit of fear inside of us as a, as a culture. And I think that fear has slowly been boiling away now. And I think there's, there's, there's moves to protect us as a, you know, a coddle our mind, I suppose, you know, to make sure that we're, we're thinking the right things that we're not sort of getting too far overblown and all that. And it's leading to this, this crazy game of, you know, of, of censorship of, of language police of thought police. And, you know, it, it, it I mean, I've been posting some, some, things on Facebook and um, and Twitter about, on my own personal account, obviously not through the, through the Smart Mystery podcast, about, you know, not, not conspiracies, but just different points of view, you know, like I like to really get a good canvas for what the left's saying, what's the right saying, you know, I consider myself a, a centrist, I suppose, um, politically, and I just like to, to see both sides, so I'm sort of promoting, you know, both both sides of, of the of the divide, and if I post something from the from the narrative, I get no, no, no kickback on it whatsoever, but if you post something that's not you know, in line with the current government guidelines or the current narrative that's going, I've actually been censored on Facebook. Facebook will pull posts down and tells me like, what are Facebook doing if they can, you know, go into my little individual post? I don't have anybody following me. I've got a group of friends that I've made over the years of tour guiding and, and traveling around and things like that, that I, that I communicate with. But, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm hardly an influencer, but they're, they're in there doing that. And yeah, you're right. That breeds conspiratorial thinking, 100%. Yeah, it's disgusting. I don't think censorship's ever a good idea. And, and the, the worst thing is that, a lot of it's coming from the media and the media that really, really scares me Like, because the media's job is to be skeptical about everything. Like if there's media that are kowtowing and towing the line, that makes me very, very concerned because the media, the guys like, you know, guys like um, Glenn Greenwald's a good example, you know, or Barry Weiss. Um, she's a startup around Substack, Substack, really, really interesting stuff. But those are the guys that, you know, you want to be getting behind and listening to because they're not afraid to, to challenge things. That's the idea of, of, of journalism, you know, and those guys would be absolutely abhorred through any version of censorship, you know, like it needs to be out there. And if you, if you listen to somebody talk about ivermectin and you eat horse paste and you die, well, sorry, you don't need that censorship. That's Darwinism. You know, you had that coming if you were that, that, you know, that's, you know, you, you are better off not in the gene pool anymore because that's just, you know, sheer idiocy. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll get some ivermectin for my horse. I'm going to, you know, I'll eat that and you die. Oh, bummer. You know, that's how it goes. Well, there used to be a thing in radio where you used to turn on to a certain station here. I'm telling you, Obama's doing deals with the devil. Obama is Satan and he's praying and Hillary and Hillary's are up top. And then you used to have this person that would speak such crazy things. And then you'd be like, Alex Jones, a kind of Alex <laughs> Jones has been right about a lot of stuff, but we'll get to that at a different time. But okay. he was on this guy was on this radio and he would do this popular show. You'd say crazy, outrageous things. And he would be completely one sided on everything, but everyone would listen to him. Like, this guy's insane. Who was that? Oh God, he just died. Oh, damn it. Oh, he's a famous radio guy who died too. And a lot of people out of the, out of the blankets blanking. 
Yeah, I know. It's um, he used to do a hundred oxycotton a day, and he actually got <laughs> death from it. His nurse was uh slipping him uh these drugs too. I got I gotta look up his name, man. It's gonna kill me. It starts with a R, said, I think. He said that much oxycontin. It's idled your mind as well. Famous political. This is gonna put me on a watch list if I look this up. Famous oh, political God. guy Sweet. who took one hundred. <laughs> This is a great podcast, Robbie. This is this is this is outstanding, mate. You know what? They love me and you. This is your finest moment. I'm telling you. <laughs> you need like you need to get like a Jamie, like a young Jamie. I do. Who I guess if he was a young Jamie, if you, he'd probably be 16 or something like that. Oh, Rush Limbaugh. Oh, the man was taking a hundred oxycotton a day, where he went deaf from it, and he had to have that thing in his ear or whatever that device to help him hear better not a hearing aid but something a little bit more but that's what i'm saying is like you used to have these crazy people to say these outrageous things he would get people that would just call in and but he would hit the same guests every single time like it's up oh, is this guy again i know what you want to talk about get it out and he would hit a topic and then we do this but he would also fake these phone calls as well too he would call and have that recording and he would play it like he was talking to someone but it was really him that he recorded prior but it was for views but then you eventually got those people that were sitting there with a flag that says hillary is a reptile and they start believing it <laughs> and then that's when oh. it got dangerous we're like maybe we need to start censoring and letting these things out there I think now the public is just, you don't know what to believe anymore. If I would have told you 15, 20 years ago, Bohemian Grove, where all these giant government politicians were sacrificing a giant burning statue in front of a thing of a wood owl, you'd be like, you're fucking nuts. Then it turns out to be true that there is a video of that and it is real stuff. And then Epstein came out and then all this stuff, your mind would physically shatter. And I think that's where we're at right now is that the world has just, everyone's brain is just shattered and turned into shit. And then we don't know what to believe. Everything you could see could be a belief. And that's why they're trying to limit as much as they possibly can. They're trying to find everything. If you ever mentioned a certain keyword, we got to ban that, even if it's just a glip in an episode, even if it's not even focused on it, or you're, unless you're supporting it, then you can stay. If you say Christ, every single word that you say, you're going to be successful. If you talk about God, that gave, God gave you your success, you're going to be successful because that's the only safe thing right now. When we never tear down someone from their religious beliefs. When do we start banning people because they just believe entirely of something, even if it's wrong, if they believe it and them themselves are convinced. I had a buddy on here say something. I'm like, you can't say that, dude. And he's like, what? I can't say that word. I was like, I get it. You're I know you're not you're not you're not horrible person at all, but a lot of people never seen you before and they're going to listen to this but it's so hard because without conversation without community aspects anymore you don't understand and you don't sense what a person's intent is and that's like the only benefit i see out of the Neuralink is that you're going to be able to sense intent so when you're watching a video you can like you can see if you can't read a facial cue and tell if a person actually means the thing that they're saying or a person doesn't understand when they're wrong then you see that's why you see old people getting in trouble all the time they don't know they are completely mm. clueless of this whole thing. Socially, we have advanced so fucking fast that I'm wondering why everything is still delayed 10 years, why everything is slowly on like technology. Everything is slowly changing when society is advancing so quick. There has to be something to implement to help us in this manner. But I don't see what that's going to be. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. Like it has it's it's crazy. Like I've always considered myself a, a fairly, you know, astute linguist, but the the way the the dialogue has changed in the last five or ten years, like you get left behind. Like, you know, people come out with terms like, you know, cis heteronormative patriarchy or something like that. And you're just like, I you know, I can't even begin to unpick and unpack what that might possibly mean. And I think, you know, some some people, depending on, on you know, which side of the divide you sit on or, you know, what, what your persuasion is, you know, there's there's certain buzzwords that you use amongst yourselves, you know, and that's, that's gets your echo chamber going. And then you almost lose the ability to properly and coherently communicate with with other people who may have a differing persuasion of you. Um, and old people, yeah, they're, they're, they must be thinking, oh, my God, like, what has happened to the world? Like, they must listen to, you know, people in their 20s and 30s talk, especially, um, you know, in social media and, on, on TV and in other, other sorts of mediums. And I think, what is going on with these people? Like, you know, I think, you know, we're still speaking English, obviously, but, um, you know, what those words mean. And, and, and words have, have always been extremely powerful, um, you know, from, from ancient times. The, obviously, we had, we probably, as a, as a species, we probably had thought, first of all, or action first, and then we had thoughts, and then we, we converted those, those thoughts into words. And, you know, for the longest of times, they were, they were very rudimentary. And, and if you look on a, 
like I hate to go down an etymological um, uh, wormhole with you there, but if you look back um, etymologically at a lot of the very, very simple words that are out there, these words go right back through time to, I guess, the cradle of civilization around Mesopotamia. Um, words like, um, like, like, like reed or boat or cow, like these very, very simple words. And they're always very, very small words. And as time has gone on, the, the language has gotten more, I guess, eloquent or, um, or, or verbose. And it's gotten a lot more complicated as well. And, you know, you can't even really be sure what somebody is saying to you sometimes, you know. And you, I think to tie into your neural link thing, I think that's probably going to have to be the natural extension of things so that you know, when somebody's talking to you and you can have a direct mind-to-mind -mind, uh, hookup with somebody, if that's what if that's the way it's going to work, as, as Elon Musk says, um, that, might, that may well be essential. And, and, and in order for us to, I guess, unite as a, as a species once more, we might need something like that because the way things are going at the moment, things are getting more and more disparate. You know, we're social creatures at heart. We've always lived in tribes and communities. You know, now we're locked down. We're, we're, we're stuck in our houses. You know, we don't have those social interactions, which are, you know, effectively what keep you, you normal. Like you go into a room and, you know, you start talking absolute gibberish and crap. People are going to let you know pretty soon that you're crazy and that's going to regulate your behavior unless you're you know, a sociopath and you don't really care about that sort of thing. But 99.9% .9 of people, you know, are going to use that, those cues, you know, watching people's reactions to you to, to regulate their own behavior. And that's how we sort of stay sane. You know, that's why the most heinous of, of punishments that, that you can give anybody and they, they still use it in prisons is, is solitary confinement. You know, you lock somebody up in a dark room without any stimulus for 10 days, you know, that sends you absolutely crazy. And now effectively we, we've, we've been in a type of solitary confinement for the, for the last 18 months, you know, and that's probably feeding into all this rage and angst and we're not understanding what we're supposed to be, we're not understanding how we're supposed to behave in the world anymore. And I think it's, it's, it's very, very concerning. So if neural link's gonna save us, Bring it on. There's um two things I wanted to say. One, I had a psychologist explain to me. They go, it, a lot of the words and the things that we replace to make our lives easier or ease of access with things that we say like "gotta go" or instead of "goodbye," it's just "later." Um, it hurts more when you look at the aspect of like when you say something like, "Did your parents ever say that I love you?" Well, my parents said, "I I love you all the time." To me, what did they say? They said, "Love you," but did they say "I"? love you. I, that little, small, little letter, that one letter. What, what's the difference? If you look at that, though, if you really examine that, that there's a different impact to I love you and love you. Love you. Mm. I love you. Mm. That is a very strong and it seems so small in the grand aspect, but it can lead to a severe mind screw of a thing when you get older, when you realize like, yeah, my parent. My, my, like my dad, for instance, always said, I love you. Never love you. I love you to me as a human being loving you. And that was such a small thing. I look back now. It's like, that's very, very important because if you just would have said love you, it's like, are you even paying? It's like when you, someone, you just go, okay. When someone's talking, you're not even really listening. You're looking at something else. It shows that in this moment, I'm listening to you and I'm understanding you and I'm talking to you and I mean you, that's something very, very important. And then. Damn it, that just threw me off track. The second one I was going to say. You ended on something, and it was so important, too. <laughs> oh! It's been one of those conversations, Robbie. It's been one of those. It's a lot deeper than I think we've gone so far in the other three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm a little bit cooked tonight, so that's probably why. That's good. You're more like thinking. Like um, we said uh, banning stuff, for instance, like the prison systems. Now, the mm. prison systems, for instance, they work how they were designed to work, but we don't. We, we think of things differently now. We look at weed is not as bad as it was before. Drugs yeah. aren't as bad as it was before. There's so many things that aren't as bad as it was before. Um, Biden in this bill that he passed is going to lessen the amount that prescription drugs are going to cost you so pharmacies can't tax you so much or can't wring your pocket dry with the amount that pills cost. And I go, everyone's like, good, yes, pharmacies, they're horrible corporations, screw big pharma. I'm like – He's in essentially helping them because what's the one drug that's better than any pill that we've seen so far help out in so many different ways? And that's marijuana. And that's still illegal. And what's that illegal for? All because someone lied in a, a system like what over almost 100 years ago, saying that it was this drug that was going to cause people to kill and rape other people that was coming out of Mexico. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense now. We know that not to be true, but nobody's focused on doing that. You know, I'm seeing a lot of 
words or things that we say and disguised up. And you can look through media. It's all about the way that they say something. When a media says that a young black kid was just killed. Why are you telling me that? I get it because to specify, but shouldn't it just be a young kid was killed no matter what Absolutely. that is? It's that yeah. small little detail. It's like you're trying to narrow it down and something you shouldn't try and just narrow it down to. You should look at that's a human being that just lost their life. But people like the specifics to it. People like the detail in that aspect. And I'm like, but these are small, small things that don't seem very big, but they lead up into a bigger causation when now you're devising and you're citing people and things that we shouldn't be cited in. You could be Australian. You could be American. You can be Canadian. You're a fucking human being. We're all the same species. We all have two legs, two arms, hopefully. Someone's out there with one arm like, fuck you. I have one arm. <laughs> Glad you're listening to the show. Thank you. But <laughs> at the same time, we're all part of the same human species, no matter if you're missing a limb or whatever. We're all homo sapiens. Or homo, homo sapiens? Yeah, homo yeah, sapiens. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just curious to why we want to device ourselves so much to the aspect of like, no wonder everyone says there is no such thing as this. There is no such thing as this. Those are just small little characteristics about us. They're sure that can be gender, or if you want to say there isn't gender, but it's the aspect of trying to help people understand the way that you think about things. You're going to have a lot. Every time we see, um, I watch a lot of Steven Crowder. I agree with some of the stuff he says, and I'm like, you could be doing this in a way better way just by fucking not challenge me. Don't do it like that. Like talk to people and help them understand, be more of an empathetic person, but he just wants to be like the, the guy who knows everything and shut people down. But yeah, I, I, I had a person that was talking through everything with them. And I was like, they're both like, they're both saying good stuff. But I think the major disconnect is that they're still so one-sided into something where like, you can tell that that person has a bias in this. And I'm like, it's just so much easier if you try and see it through the other person's lens and understand that they're not out there to rid the world of a certain ethnicity or a certain gender they're out there because everything that they've ever accumulated in their life has got them into the point that they're at now is why they think this way or are they doing it for fucking views and that's when it gets crazy you can either be a really good person and be a rob Lowe style character that has some fame mm. to them or you can be an outrageous steven crowder type character where people literally click on your videos just to hate you but you still get the <laughs> views and you still make the money that's how the world works it's fucking nuts <laughs> rob Lowe, that man is like a bottle of red wine he just gets he's better good, with dude. age he's amazing him. listen the, the drugs is a is a really interesting one um you know prohibition and, and government intervention in in how we live our lives and how you know we comport ourselves in our, in our social time and things it's a relatively new thing i think you know america introduced you know alcohol prohibition post um uh, post the 1920s you know which was, which was an absolute freaking disaster they, you know, people they gonna... put poison in the, the alcohol and people drank that yeah, yeah. Well, then, I mean, that was the birth of the mafia, you know, the mafia were bootlegging alcohol, you know, throughout the States. And that's how that came about. So that didn't work out well for them, you know, and banning things like um, you know, LSD and cannabis and things like that. It's absolute madness. If you go back in time, like the ancients were getting high as fuck all the time, you know, and they, they integrated that shit within their lives. And that was how they, they found, you know, I guess their spiritualism, you know, they found a connection into something else, you know, and a, a good example is the, um, the uh, Eleusian Mysteries, which was a, a, a rite of passage, I guess you could say, that happened at a town called Eleusis. It's about about 12 or 13 miles uh, northwest, I think, of Athens. And what used to happen at the at, at Eleusis was there was a was a temple uh, to Demeter, who was the the mother goddess, the god of the goddess of the harvest, and um, the Eleusin, Eleusinian um, novitiates would come there and they'd go through these rites of passage. It's called the mysteries, and they drink a, a special potion and they would basically go on a trip. And it was, you know, we don't really know many of the details to this ritual now, hence it's called the mysteries, but it was very, very popular throughout the ancient world. And um, even the Romans uh, got involved in that, you know, while they were in control of Greece and Marcus Aurelius, uh, who was a very famous emperor in the, in the second century, uh, experienced the Ele Eleusinian mysteries. And um, he writes about it in, in reasonable, in, in very scarce detail, but he, he references a little bit in some of his works that we still have today called the meditations. And, you know, those guys, Obviously, there the Greeks and the Romans did some pretty fantastic things in and around um, you know, sociology, archaeology, art, architecture, you, you name it. And they were, you know, they were getting high. They didn't need any government intervention and things like that. I think people will will naturally, you know, find their own ways. I mean, um, Portugal not so long ago decriminalized everything. You know, you want to 
you want to get some heroin, you can go to Portugal. No worries at all. You know, you want some LSD, it's all there. And Portugal's still functioning as a country. You know, it hasn't descended into drug craze madness, you know, and it just doesn't just doesn't hold any water. Like, you know, if, if you're going to get high, for example, you're not going to go and rob a bank. It's way too fucking high to go rob a bank. You know, you're not, going to, you're not going to commit domestic violence. You know, you're way too high for that. You're not even going to speed. You're going to sit there at, for you for you Americans, you know, 20 miles an hour going, hey, man, this is really, really, really cool. Like, it just doesn't just doesn't hold any water when, when it comes to me. I don't understand why the government needs to get so, um, be so interventionist in, it, in its behaviour because, you know, the government should be there to, you know, pick up the garbage bins, make sure the grass is cut at the park, make sure the swings are swinging back and forth, make sure the roads are there. But as far as, you know, dictating how, how we live our lives, you know, like we should have the choice to do that. And that's, that's what real freedom is, you know. And I think the, the freedom of speech you have in America is an absolutely amazing thing. Like it's, 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 it's unheard of in, in humankind, the, the ability to have that sort of, that sort of freedom. And if that could be extended to, to a great deal of other things, no, I'm, look, I'm not saying that, you know, people should be allowed to, to marry horses um, or, or anything like that. And that's, you know, that's just insane. But in general, there should be a lot more free. Yeah, look, you, you're going to miss out on that one, but you know, there should be a little bit more freedom in life. And I think, you know, um, what I've, uh, do you live in California? Where, where do you live in? America? I live on the East Coast, so I'm actually on. Are you the on the East Coast? Yeah. Oh right, okay. So there's no um, like legal marijuana over there, is there? I mean, we have shops for it. It's just all about, like I said, with the legality of drugs, it's about just the government wants to make a profit off of it, and it's very, very hard to make a profit off pot. They're getting a way to do it now, and I think that's why it's picking up steam. But that's the thing. It's like when people like complain about like why isn't this person doing that? I'm like. Like people complain about Elon Musk a lot. I'm not I'm not necessarily I don't really hate him. I watched his documentary. I didn't know he had six kids and lost one at 10 weeks old. And then he threw himself into his work. And that's when this whole entire different person came out. But I look well, at it like it's just a person when you say, why aren't they donating their billions of dollars to help us? Well, there's no incentive for them to give away their money just to help people. They don't know you. They're not connected to you. You expect a billionaire to want to donate money to you because you're going through a situation? That doesn't make any sense. If you had a billion dollars, you're not going to donate to someone you don't know. I don't expect famous people to want to do my show because they see uh, maybe I'm consistent every day or maybe I might have a good thing. I don't expect that because there's no incentive for them to even watch it or be a part of it because it's not benefiting them at all. You're not incentivizing people to help other people. So then we're just on this eventual down downgrade of society where we're going to have more people closed off because you're not get you got to incentivize people to do this and go back to what we said in the beginning you get something out of somebody that's how it starts but that doesn't need to stay like that forever eventually our natural instinct is going to be to help somebody when you see a person on the side of the road with their tire blown out and they're sitting there like don't know what to do and they have their you know their car looks like they're broke down a lot of people stop and say are you okay do you need help because they're not really expecting anything out of it, but they know what happens if they were in that situation. Eventually, the world will get to that point where, like, is this thing that I'm about to say to this person, is that going to make them really upset? Like, I would get upset if someone said something about me online. Maybe I shouldn't type that comment. It just needs to be extended over there a little bit. And I think that'll eventually happen when, if we can incorporate more in society of that what that feels like to be in that situation. We don't have a lot of that. A lot of people talk about like the mm. Pakistan thing. People have empathy for Pakistan, but it's more political than it is anything. You have empathy about people over there. We should go and help those people. We should do this. Okay, that's 100% true. But at the same time, are you not understanding? You're fighting in your own country. You're doing the same shit. It's not explosions every second, but it's some horrible stuff still. Eventually, you type in a comment, someone's going to blow their fucking head off. You are you worried about that? That's not going to happen. How do you know if I wrote a comment about you? Would you probably end up getting really upset by it? Yeah, I would be upset, but I wouldn't let it bother me. OK, all right, sure. Like people talk about Trump's banned off social media. I'm not a Trump fan and I'm not a Biden fan. <laughs> I'm right in the middle kind of. And I look at like banning him off social media. I would hate to be him because you know how many people are talking shit about you and then you can't defend yourself. I know how that would suck if people talk shit on me. It sucks. You try and ignore it. You try and go away. But nobody wants to be a bad guy. Nobody sets out to be the devil of the apocalypse unless you're Dick Cheney. And then <laughs> you got to understand, like, people find these enemies and they build them up in their head as this is exactly how this fight would go. Like when they have a mask fight, 
you look at a person who's not wearing a mask in a store and you know you're supposed to wear a mask, you build it up into your head of like, this is how the conversation is going to go. It's like an interview when you prep for an interview in the mirror. They build up this battle in their head and then they go up to this person at a level 10 energy like, you better put your fucking mask on. And the person just goes, okay, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't know it bothered you that much. I'll put it on. And they put it on their mask and they go, I thought you were going to, you're not going to refute me. You're not going to fight me. No, I, I'm sorry, man. Wow, that went differently in my head. No shit, because you're all fucking creating your own. It's, it's like schizophrenia, dude. It's crazy. Yeah, it's very disarming in that in that sense, you know. I think the Trump and Biden thing. It's very, very interesting to me that you know you got you guys got 330 million people over. You got some brilliant people, and out of like you know all those people, the two best people to run the country are basically a, a narcissistic maniac and a dude that is probably already dead and it just doesn't realize it yet. Really, really strange to, Dude, to watch the hold on, on yeah. Twitter. It was trending people. The, the word instructed, just search that up instructed on Twitter. I didn't know what that was. And I clicked on it and it was in Biden's press conference. He goes, I have been instructed to call on from MSNBC and everyone's like, in <laughs> so they gave you, they, they pick someone in the crowd that they talk to, to give you softball questions. It's like when that one uh, uh, mayor, was interviewed by his brother and it just tossed him softball questions like get to the fucking horrible money embezzling and they're like no what do you do on your sundays it's like what the fuck are we <laughs> talking about here and he started to realize like even with trump like why was he like people bring up the golfing thing why yeah why the fuck is that happening the funniest thing is i said all right if we really want to test the simulation let's get a libertarian in office the one who's just doesn't want to focus lets everyone do their job that they're supposed to do and not control of everything that's what like a libertarian is kind of in the middle in a way and i go they go well a libertarian would never win it's always republicans don't want it democrats don't want it and they would do anything to make sure none of this ever wins. so it's always a republican and democrat out of all the presidents yeah. we've had never a libertarian never anything else just republican or democrat why are those two always tackling that one that's the only time they can join together and then every other time they hate each other yeah, yeah, yeah. I start yeah. to We're look gonna, at yeah. like what what is this? We've got exactly the same thing over here. What for us, I guess you'd probably say uh, it's tough to say. Liberals are probably more of the conservative, the republics, I suppose, and Labor's probably shifting towards more Democrat. In that, the, I guess the Democrats are probably leaning towards the left, which is more communism, and then the the like the liberals over here lean more to the right, like the republics, you know, heading towards fascism, I guess you know, and nationalisation racial eugenics and, and things like that it's a it's a very interesting dichotomy and these guys like you know these independent people don't get any air whatsoever but i mean there's there's some brilliant people in america that you know like uh what's what's her name tulsi gabbard she's yeah. amazing um she's an absolutely amazing person they called her um, a russian spy and then when they went into the interview oh, and talked about it a, she she shut them down because there's no evidence of her dealing yes, with russia that ever. was on the view wasn't it on the view like she hammered them i saw that i saw that actually that was a great. shit show there's nobody oh, the intelligent on that show seriously that, that show's ridiculous like we get a little bit of that over here like it's out it's out of control but i mean that's that's probably half the problem robert you know like these the people that are leading these countries you know and we've got similar issues with with our prime minister uh, over here and and they have the same sorts of problems in france you know with emmanuel macron and in the uk as well with boris johnson like he's he's a he's a weirdo like you know we've got this this is who's leading us you know any wonder we're dissolving into you know absolute madness beneath it you know like the the, the problems in, in society are, are systemic and structural, you know, not in not in so much, you know, racist or, or ideological terms, but in terms of competence. You know, there's just nobody competent at the top, you know, and these guys that we vote, you know, to to serve us and to, you know, as elected members of the community, you know, like they're they're basically akin to selfish ancient oligarchs, you know, who are purely just in it for themselves and they do not care who gets trodden under their wagon carts as they head off to the market or whatever it might be. I think it begins with the disconnect with people when you are in that high power, like even if, if I was, I would never want to be president. And it's funny because I've never had a dream about being president. So that's probably something that's just not on my mind ever. You got my vote, man. I appreciate it. I don't want that though. <laughs> I, yeah. I can't, I would never want to be in power only on the aspect of, I know I'm an egomaniac and that would just go to my head. And it's like in a game, there's a game called fable. It's a very, very good game. And I found, um, yeah. when you have to make promises throughout the game, and then when you're king, you can choose to accept those promises and all the money that you end up losing, you have to pull out of your own bank account. So hopefully if you have enough in your own bank account into the giant vault, you don't have to worry about the amount of money you have in your bank is the amount of people that get saved. So throughout the thing, a person comes to you, are you going to keep your promise about keeping my town the way it is and not changing it? Or you could go the money option with fracking their whole town and destroying all their natural <laughs> landscape. 
most people like, I, I don't want people to die though, but I got to do this. So you're going to be an enemy, but a lot of people are going to be saved or you're going to be the nice guy. And a lot of people are going to die. It's like this weird thing of like, it's very, very hard to keep your promises once you become in the position of power because you're not at that low spot anymore. You don't know what it's like to be at ground level. Whenever they do a business opportunity, someone in the restaurant industry has worked their way up from busboy all the way up to manager because they know all those things. But after a while of not working the line or having your feet up at a desk or office or some type of CEO building, you lose touch with the ground problems that are going on. And that's everything that we see with all these political people. They don't know the problems anymore. They read it on a piece of paper. And when you're reading it on a paper is different from experiencing it and seeing it. That's why I think everyone, you have to localize your problems. You can't look to some other giant one person to give you everything. You have to look at like, okay, we know what's going on in our town. So then we can make the best decisions on what's good for our town. It's like with the mask mandates, it's all different depending on your state. And I'm like, cause they know what their fucking state is. Now there might be some very, very small vocal few that say this state impeach this. There was a hashtag trending death to DeSantis, which is like, <laughs> death to someone are we at that point already like i look at that like yeah. i don't care what that person establishes or what that person believes in but no death to anybody i don't want death on anybody that's a terrible thing to say yeah governor DeSantis, sure surely not i mean he's got a uh, to my ears anyway he's got such a lo lovely accent but yeah i mean he's just he's just a person at the end of the day doing his job but the the problem is and you see it with with any advanced society um throughout time that as things get to a certain point and it's it, there's always a wealth question you know it's the the top you know one percent top 0.5 percent whatever it might be the you know the upper echelons of the wealth you know those guys consolidate all of the power they basically live in you know gated communities effectively you know and they're, they're pursuing a life that is unattainable by from, from from most people can never ever have to attain it. You know, I just and picture then, a regular person touching their shirt. Don't touch me. Don't get your poor yeah, hands oh, off me. Yeah. Just wiping their shirt. <laughs> picture, you know, Julius Caesar, for example, you know, marching into the forum, you know, with all these lackeys around him, his bright white toes. You know, that's that's the that's the world we live in at the moment. You know, it's the world of the the demagogue. And once the demagogue starts to take control, and Trump is a prime example of the demagogue, um, you know, they, uh, Pericles was a big one in, in Athens. Um, Sparta had its, had its demagogues as well. Uh, Rome obviously had a series of demagogues, which led to the led to the fall of the Republic and the beginning of the Principate. You know, with with Marius and Sulla, Pompey, uh, Crassus, and and finally Caesar, and then Augustus to 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 rule out the Republic. You know, this is what happens to societies. You know, these these great people. They, they speak the right words. They know the, the the magic incantation to, you know, get people to adore them and adhere to them loyally. And, you know, they abuse that power at the end of the day. It's all for themselves. And that's basically, it scares me, like, as a, as a, like I said, as a historian before, it scares me that, that I see so many tangents with the ancient world, with with the world that we live in now, with so many of the, of the things that are going on, in particular, the way we're, you know, dissolving in on each other, you know, we're not concerned with, with, outside concerns anymore like we should be like you mentioned Afga Afghanistan before I think you were talking about um, these are the you know North Korea you know the Uyghurs in in China um, you know the slavery in in the the Arabian Peninsula in Northern Africa like there's there's massive issues out there and you know we as a society don't give a shit we're just interested in ourselves and the people who are leading us are exactly the same you know, it's a oh. terrible situation or we're worried about what people think of us. And that means yeah, we have just... to say a bunch of things that we aren't actually doing anything to help. Like I know so many people that have like hashtag this or hashtag that in their profile picture. I'm like, but what are you doing besides putting it in your profile? Because if it wasn't in your profile, I wouldn't know you actually support those things. Mm, yeah, it's like being, you know, it's, it's virtue signal, right? You know, yeah. that's exactly what, exactly what it is, you know, for no other purpose than, you know, like people putting masks on in their, in their buyers and that sort of stuff, you know, like you, you should wear masks. It's, it's responsible if there's a mask mandate on where you're going. To, that's what we're doing as a culture, as a city, and we'll do that. But, you know, the, the virtue signaling is, yeah, you know, worrying what other people are thinking of you is exactly the same as worrying about yourself because that's all you're focused on. You're seeing yourself through other people's eyes. You know, you want that image to be, to be positive. You know, you need, you know, like I think, we talked about very early on, we need to get back to, to basics, you know, as a, as a society and start thinking of the ways that we have, the things we have in common, rather than focusing on the little things that we have, have you know, against us. Like, I guarantee you, like some of these people that are arguing like crazy on Facebook or Twitter, they probably, you know, if you sat them down and gave them a questionnaire about, you know, values and, and what's important, you know, like family, um, you know, friendships and, you know, like you know, peace and, and, you know, food for the, for the hungry and money for the poor, they probably agree on 95% of things. There's focusing on this one little thing, you know, and it's getting you know, all sorts of crazy about it. It's, um, it's, it upsets me. I don't think, 
I, I've met a lot of people, and I know for a fact that if any of these people met in person, that there wouldn't be this fighting that was going on. Ah, that was not. Nobody yeah. acts like that in person. Everybody just acts like that online because online there's no facial connection. There's no res like able to connect to the human aspect of who we are as people. And I think yeah. when you see someone's face like how me and you are doing now, if we were messaging back and forth and having a conversation where it was just our like I did audio only for the longest time. It was you, we could sit there and agree and talk about a bunch of stuff, but there's no facial connect to see like if I'm going off on a tangent or a rant, you know, I'm either joking or I'm getting to a bigger point. You can <laughs> sense that because you can see my eyes leading up into that. But yeah, when it's like yeah. there's no connection of that, when it's just somebody like um, I put up a tweet uh, saying like somebody's uh, the guy, little Nas is complaining that he couldn't put blood in his shoes. But Tony Hawk can make 100 skateboards with his blood in the whatever on the writing of it. And I go, <laughs> everyone's complaining about this type of stuff. I'm like, you know, Kiss did this in 1997. Like they made their <laughs> first book that I own because my dad's a big Kiss guy. And it, it has their all the band members blood as the ink on the original 100 copies of that book. Like this isn't new. We knew people that were metal fans that love the aspect of metal, Satan, all that, whatever you want to talk about. They weren't trying to summon the devil. Maybe some were, but there weren't all like, I'm going to kill kids for the devil or nothing. There, no, it wasn't like that. It was just something edgy, cool, and against the norm system. But everyone's mm. like, no, there's some in it. Back when Rock was first created, you ever see the movie Dewey Cox? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. It's with John C. Oh. Riley. It's like a Johnny Cash like parody movie, but he's playing like a song like I want to hold your hand, like kind of like a Beatles type thing. And this priest gets up. It's the devil's music. And then the guy punches <laughs> the priest in the face and they're all start having <laughs> sex on the dance floor. It's a joke. It's a drastic freaking realization of something that that's what it was back in the day they used to create music that wasn't this classic frank sinatra and everyone thought it was the devil's music and they used to try and burn them burn like go pitchforks and fortunes or let me rephrase that pitchforks <laughs> and torches see i rant so much i end up that was tough yeah no that was but, a tough one when they when they do this type of things, it doesn't mean that person actually wants to summon the devil. Do you think Johnny Cash wanted to kill himself by lighting himself in a burning ring of fire? But you <clears> get the disconnect from people and you start to realize like, oh, fuck, like this is what this person means. No, it's not. They're just saying something for comedic effect or they're saying something as a song lyric. There are so many song lyrics where it's like, how is that? A, how can they say that? But I can't say it. It's like, no, it's in the song. You're able to do it if it's in a song. Quentin Tarantino, if you watch his movies, you'd be like, well, this is some crazy outrageous stuff. And you realize it's a white guy that makes the movies like made Django. And you're like, oh, and he goes, because it's creative art. You know, that person doesn't believe any of that stuff. He's making a work of art for you to enjoy as a person. Nope. He's like, I don't really. I mean, maybe he gets shit from his movies. I haven't seen anybody speak out unless it was the Bruce Lee thing. Because a lot of people didn't like the way he. Put it. <laughs> but I was like. Look, you got to understand, does a person actually feel the thing that they're saying? Or are they doing it to either rile people up or are they doing it because they are might be? I don't I have no clue, but people jump to assumptions on things and without talking to the person or without looking into the full context of things, it's like a clickbait article. You're not sorting out the facts for yourself like you're supposed to. You're reading a headline and you're running off with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does your dad know that you're um, telling the world he's a KISS fan? Well, considering my dad was in a Kiss tribute band and was played in an actual commercial with Kiss, I'd hope so. Yes. I'll have to is... send you old pictures, okay. but my dad like, give, give us a photo. You can look up on YouTube for people listening to it's a uh, Kiss Swedish lottery commercial. Um, in the back of the drum or on the back of the pickup truck on the drum set is the cat, and that's my dad. My dad was with the actual Kiss members in that commercial and stuff like that. My Out dad was control. Yeah, he was in this big Kiss tribute. It was, that's all I knew was Kiss back in the day. That's awesome. There you go. I can imagine him dressed up in the black and white makeup too. Speaking, like, to, to tie in uh, to the heavy metal theme, it would be remiss not to uh, to draw your attention to my last episode in Spartan History Podcast. I had this uh, Dr. Jeremy Swist on, and he's a uh, expert in the classical reception of of Sparta within, or more importantly, the classics within heavy metal music. So he's done this exhaustive work of cataloging all of the heavy metal music that has Spartan references and other classical references, Alexander the Great, the Romans and things like that. He's, he's got uh, tables and charts of all the different events, like how many times the Thermopylae was mentioned, how many times the Tudorburg Forest was mentioned, and he's just done all this work. Fascinating conversation. It was an absolute rip-roaring uh, time. The guy was an expert on it. It's amazing. Um, 
the cultural influences that, that heavy metal music um, have and where they where they draw it from. You know, it's all these themes of like you know blood and guts and and fighting you know to the dying man and you know um, you know touching victory out of the jaws of defeat and things like that. It's a, it's a crazy crazy um, genre. It's the hard edge of motivational speaking. Yeah, well said. Well mm-hmm. said. Well, Steve, where can people find your podcast? Where can people find your links? Absolutely. Website's www.spartanhistorypodcast.com. Uh, you find me on Twitter at Spartan underscore history and on Facebook at Spartan History Podcast. And is there anything you want to end on to the people out there listening? No, Robbie, let me just say it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be on the show for the fourth, maybe third time. And uh, I just wish you all the best, mate. We're going to uh, stay tuned for we're going to have a Mark and we're going to have a Steve episode at the same time and see how that goes. We're going to have casting through ancient Greece. Shout out to him and also Spartan history with a little bit out of the blank in the mix. (laughs) That'll be fun. Look forward to it.